singularity. Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Singularity One on One. Singularity One on One is a regular podcast feature of Singularity Weblog where you can go and listen to it or download it in full. As you may already know, my name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and as always, I am the man with the questions. Today, my guest on the show is Vivek Watwa. Vivek is one of those absolutely incredible people that I was very fortunate to meet this summer at Singularity University. And uh, I am having the serious trouble here of describing exactly what he does and what institutions he is associated with because the list is way too long and growing. So I would simply ask you, Vivek, to perhaps uh, 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 present yourself instead of me messing it up. <laughs> I'm, I'm a tech guy who happened to become an academic. And now I'm hanging around with brilliant scientists and uh, thinkers at Singularity University. So <laughs> I have affiliations right now with Stanford, with Duke, with Emory, and SU is where I'm spending the majority of my time. That's, that's fascinating. So um, I will go back to your relationship and what you do at Singularity University a little bit later. But before we jump into the meat of our conversation here, <coughs> I like to start my interviews by digging deeper into my guest's background. Because I believe that we should all live the message that we preach uh, and, and kind of trace our own path to where we are today. That's why I want to start with, with the beginning, if I may. Uh, and that is to say, uh, so first of all, you are on your website, you say that you're an entrepreneur, academic, researcher, and so on. Uh, if you are to put yourself in a single word here, how would you describe yourself? Uh, my favorite one is entrepreneur, actually. <laughs> if I had to pick one, I'd pick entrepreneur. That's fantastic, because I want to grab that and then ask you this then. Right. So when was it that you decided to become an entrepreneur and how and why? It happened by accident. I mean, I had uh, I started my career, career as a computer programmer. I was just a lowly computer programmer writing code. And then eventually I joined First Boston where we had a problem to solve. The problem was that um, this was now mid-1980, 1986 actually. And the company wanted to move all of its systems over to a client server platform, except this is like 20 years before, not 20, about 10 years before client server became the norm. And there were no tools to make it happen. There was no middleware. There were no development tools. There was no infrastructure to make it happen. So the company decided that they were going to bet everything on um, uh, going to client server. And I was in charge of architecture. So I got uh, put in charge of making it happen. I ended up building some computer aided software engineering tools, case tools which did the impossible. It was like Star Wars in those days. <laughs> you could code in very high level specifications that would generate the entire system that ran on multiple tiers of computing. This was the first case technology out there and it was really revolutionary for its time. It was so successful that IBM came to us in 1989. In 1990, we spun off a company to market our, uh, our technology. So you had the uh, investment bank, First Boston, providing the technology and you had the uh, technology company providing the, the money, which was a, a really weird situation. So I became an accidental entrepreneur. I just, it just happened that my technology uh, had so much potential that uh, we wanted to spin it, spin it off. And I took over as executive vice president, number two in the company and uh, chief technology officer. The company did really well. We grew from zero to 120 million in five years, conquered the world you know, in the financial services industry. And we were on the road to success when we uh, went public. That's, that's a fascinating story. And, and so if you were a sort of an accidental entrepreneur, as you put it, is it fair to say that you are also an accidental technologist or singularitarian? Yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, are you kidding? Uh, so later in my career, I had a heart attack and that was my life changing event. I had to decide whether I want to get back into technology or do something different. So I thought I'd take, an, uh, take it easy and become an academic for a while. I thought that you know, I'm dealing with a country club like Lawns, you know, you go to Stanford or Duke, it's like a country club, right? <laughs> so I thought I would take it easy and enjoy my life and, and take it, you know, do all that. Except I started getting more and more embroiled in academic research. I started challenging all the myths and the authorities and all the experts. And I became very well known in academia. And um, I was pretty well set in academia. We, you know, uh, came to Berkeley and uh, I was doing my thing. 
and then um, uh, Salim uh, Ismail invited me to come and visit uh, Singularity University. I had no idea what SU was. I mean, uh, but uh, I, you know, I used to drive by Route 101 and see this big hangar over there, and it looked like a mysterious campus over there. So when he told me it was on the NASA campus, I said, "Sure, I, you know, I, I decided to go there on a Friday morning while, while uh, uh, but the GSP was going on, and I thought I'd go and hang out for a couple of hours, uh, um, you know, an hour or two, basically, because that's as much time as I had. I had so many meetings the whole day. So I came there in the morning. You know, you walk into the NASA, and it's like going to Cheyenne Mountain, like on you know Star Trek. You see that you go to this uh, fortress, as it seems." And you're in a different universe from Silicon Valley. You know, you, you, you've seen it, right? I mean, right from Silicon Valley, you're going into this, uh, this exotic science uh, uh, campus. So I went there, I went into Singularity University, and there was, um, um, who was it? It was um, Dan Barry was talking about robotics and, and uh, doing projections of the future. And then Daniel Kraft was giving his thing. And I, I just sort of sat there, and it completely blew my mind. I had thought that artificial intelligence was dead. I mean, I was one of those people who were so excited about it in the 1980s and uh, even until early 90s, I thought that there might be some hope, some hope in uh, AI, but I thought AI was dead. And he was uh, a scientist, an astronaut, talking about how AI is now powering all these robots and so on. And then medicine. I thought medicine was just the, uh, you know, the domain of uh, the big pharma companies and that there was no, no advances that were worthy of happening. That I had done research on the pharma industry and I documented that uh, the U.S. pharma industry is, is offshoring because it's become too difficult to uh, do drugs. So I knew a lot about the pharma industry. And he was Daniel Kraft talking about all these advances in, in, uh, in medicine. And it completely blew my mind. So by the time I was done, I ended up uh, calling up all the meetings. that you know I, I had a whole bunch of meetings that day. I canceled every one of them. I don't normally do this to people. But I said, look, I'm sorry. I, I, you know, uh, uh, I have a mind-blowing emergency. I need to uh, just uh, cancel and I'll reschedule and make it up to you. So I canceled my whole thing. It was there the whole day. And I walked out in a complete daze. I mean, I, I had no idea that all these exponential technologies were happening. So that was almost a life-changing event for me. And then later on, um, um, I think it was Neil Jacobstein invited me to, to uh, uh, you know, mentor students during the summer. Um, and then Peter DeMantis takes me out to lunch. And uh, I mean, it was a big honor to meet Peter DeMantis. This was like the second or third time I'd met him. And Peter DeMantis says, Vivek, uh, I want to offer you the role of president of Singularity University. I said, oh my God, Peter, what are you talking about? I mean, me, you know, I felt so humbled. But uh, you know, the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing is because I don't want to do uh, operational things. This is why I haven't taken over any companies that uh, mm -hmm. I needed to stay out of the, the stressful life. So I, I couldn't say no to Peter. So I worked out a deal by which I would do half time mm -hmm. at Singularity and half-time all my other things. So, so this is how I'm here. So what is your current position uh, proper in at Singularity University? I'm working with Rob Nail and the team basically on heading up academics, which means that uh, all of the, uh, you know, um, the functions about what we teach, how we teach it, the curriculum and so on, all I'm dealing with all of that. Plus, I'm also helping take SU to the next level. That's, SU is almost like a, it's almost as, secret, as much a secret as is a NASA campus. I mean, it's a mystery. People have heard a little bit about it. They drive by it. They know there's this high-tech scientific university over there, but no one really knows what SU is all about. So I'm, I'm trying to change all that. I mean, I'm, I'm very good at marketing. I mean, I, uh, I'm very good at positioning. I'm, you know, I'm good at PR. These are things I've done in my career before. So I'm now trying to help SU get to the next level. So now, uh, in terms of formalizing the responsibilities of the faculty, and I mean, we've got world-class people, just uh, the most amazing faculty you can imagine. I mean, I, I, uh, every day I go there, I sort of, uh, you know, I'm so grateful that I, I get to hang out with people like this. Just one after the other, all of our faculty are world class people. So it's an honor to be, you know, to be associated with them, to be even on, you know, on the same website as some of these people is a huge honor. So I go there really grateful to be part of this thing and to work with these people. So what I'm trying to do now is to help them now formalize and structure and take it to the next level mm -hmm. so that SU can really make its mark and change the world. Yeah, I feel very jealous about that myself personally because... I feel jealous also that I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed myself so much when I was there. Right. Uh, but, you know, my wife has a circus company business here in Toronto, so it's not an option for us to, to go there and stay there. 
Yeah, um, you've seen the mag- magnificent people we have, just the uh, most amazing people. I can name it's faculty member after faculty member. I mean, yeah. Mark Goodman. I mean, the guy is just, you know, genius. I mean, Andrew Hessel. I mean, uh, you know, Ralph. I mean, uh, like you said, just go to the list of faculty on the website. You'll see just amazing person after amazing person. So it's hard not to feel small in front of them. And this weekend, we were in uh, Los Angeles at the Fox Studios, special event that we held. And, you know, Craig Venter came in on his private jet. Dean came and spent two days over there. Uh, you know, the wind, wind surf uh, was there, for, uh, for, I, th- I think, for two, for two days. I mean, mm-hmm. Sebastian Thrun, all these great people yeah, yeah, that yeah. you read about, they come and they donate their time to us. They just yeah, sort of yeah. hang out and, uh, uh, you know, they just want to be part of it and, and do all they can for the world. Great humans, but just to be in the same room as, as them is such a huge honor. It's unbelievable indeed. And, and I have to admit one of my sins is that uh, this summer I created amazing fr- friendships and uh, incredible relationships which are ongoing across yeah, the absolutely. globe right now. So far, so I've talked about the faculty. I haven't talked about the students. I mean, not, uh, the caliber of students we accept. You know, the, the, the good news and the bad news is that the caliber of students is extremely high so that the vast majority of people who apply to us can't get admitted because we only have 80 slots in summer. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was really lucky that I managed to squeak in. How, how did you get in? I mean, what did you do, bribe someone? Uh, no, <laughs> I, I was just literally very lucky. I was on the waiting list for two and a half, three months. Right. And I was told that I am in on full scholarship 36 hours before the end. Wow. Before the beginning, that is. Before the beginning right. of the program. And and the only reason that that happened was because somebody didn't show up, I, I suspect. Right. Uh, so So... In very real terms, I squeaked in by mere luck, right. uh, and and uh, yeah. But but going back, uh, yeah, I, I one of the, the things that I didn't do as well as I could have done was uh, uh, my relationship with Mark Goodman, and and um, I realize that now, and I should uh, um, should have done better in that sense. That's one Mark of the things. Mark is in San Francisco a lot. You can connect with him. Um, oh, actually, you're in Toronto. Him, him, I'm sure he's coming and speaking there as well. The guy's a genius. You should meet him. I mean, absolutely. Spend some time with him. No, he, he was our team leader. Uh, he was our team leader. But but uh, we did have uh, some some friction issues. And, and uh, looking back at the whole experience, that's the, perhaps the only thing that I regret and that I didn't do as well as I should have done personally. Yes. Um, so well, tell us. Send an email to him to watch this interview. And uh, I'm sure he'll come and give you a hug. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but let's go back to your position, and I want to ask you this specific question, which actually a person uh, asked me recently, and which was this, in terms of academics. So SU is this very cutting-edge, very forward-looking institution, and yet, seemingly, it is embracing this archaic model of bringing people uh, in a physical uh, proximity, in a physical building, and creating a university instead of something else. So... On the one hand, it's saying well, we're the, so the, different. You've got to realize that, um, because I've also looked into that, uh, we have to be online, but the fact is that the magic happens when you put people together. So you have to bring people together into an archaic setting, and they have to brainstorm with each other to change the world. So the bottom line is that um, to do the type of things we're doing, you need to bring people together, because the magic happens when you brainstorm with other, when you learn from each other. And even the ups and the downs, the fact that you have... Uh, friction with other people, you have some people with egos and so on. Those are important human interactions which help you, uh, you know, which force you to think smarter and which cause you to, uh, to innovate. Yeah, I, I am guilty as charged on all levels, at the ego level. And... I, I don't see us ever getting to the point that, I mean, maybe 20 years from now we'll have virtual holodecks which are just like getting together physically, but we're, we're far from that. Yeah, but we'll that was... We finally see the singularity before we achieve those holodecks. <laughs> exactly, but that was my answer almost verbatim because my my belief is that after the program is over the biggest uh, uh, benefit and the most uh, incredible thing is the network is the people that you have met is those personal and professional relationships that you managed to form because we live we, we lived and we slept with with uh, all those people for 10 weeks in the same building there you know and and we just spent you know 16, 18 hours per day with each other. And so after the, that's such a bonding experience that after it's over, you feel really like a family. It, it's unbelievable. Yeah, exactly. It's so, unbelievable. so that's, you, do, you said you have to do that with that. And also being on the NASA campus, yeah. it sort of adds a mystique to it. It sort of, uh, 
it, it, it's unique. It's, you know, outside Silicon Valley, you're not, I mean, everyone's in Silicon Valley, you're crowded. It, you know, it's, it's different. Here, it's like being in, on a desert island away from it all. You're, yet you're in the middle of Silicon Valley. That's the beauty about the location we're in. Yeah, and it's, it, that's transformational in its own sake. Uh, absolutely. So, but let me ask you this. You, I, I've watched uh, probably eight or ten hours of videos with you today before our interview, and I read a few of your articles. So, you have this um, reputation for being a bit of a contrarian. Uh, no. Very, <laughs> very <laughs> provocative uh, and straight shooter. So, let me ask you this, though. Are you a singularitarian now? Um, I don't believe in uh, singularity itself. I mean, I'm not, I, I, you know, uh, I respect Ray, but I'm, I'm not sure if uh, we're going to have this man-machine convergence and so on, but frankly, it doesn't matter. I'm not looking that far. Um, but what I do know for, for sure is that there are a lot of amazing technologies that, ex that are moving amazingly fast, and these technologies are converging. So you have medicine and computing converging, 3D uh, printing and robotics, uh, AI, you know, nanomaterials, all the stuff we teach, all converging. This is happening now. This, it happened within this decade. And I, and I firmly believe that this is the most innovative period in human history, that we will achieve more in this decade than we've achieved in centuries before this. So this is when a lot of great things are going to happen. So what happens 30 years from now, whether there's a singularity or not, I don't know, I don't care, it's irrelevant. I don't expect to live forever, I don't want to live forever. I mean, I just um, uh, want to help you know, solve the problems of mankind, eradicate hunger, poverty, make sure everyone has enough energy, you know, so that they can do what they need to do. I want to do all the good I can for the world uh, in the next 10 or 20 years. Yeah, so that's, that's precisely what I wanted to get out of this question. So I wanted to get out the angle that your, what got you in there in the first place was not so much the tech site as the impact site, as the site the which has yeah. improved the life of a billion people positively within 10 years or so. Yeah, right? Nicola, you've got to realize that, you know, I had a massive heart attack when I was 45, okay? When you have a near-death experience, it changes the entire outlook on, on life. I'm not making money now, okay? Mm -hmm. Even with Singularity, I, I, I haven't, I, I've been there for so long, didn't bother about taking even a cent from them. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to change that in the future because I need to, but the point is that I've done all this for this university and all the other universities without taking anything back in return because I don't care about making money now. It's about giving back to the world. That I want to do all the good I can while I'm alive. I mean, I want to make an impact. I want to help solve the problem so that so that our children, basically, you know, the humanity is looked after, that we've done as much good for the world as we can. And again, I, you know, after hanging out at SU, this is why I'm spending virtually all my time at SU now. I mean, I'm, I'm not there 20 hours a week, as I promised Peter. I'm working 50, 60 hours a week, whenever I can, as much as I can work, I'm working with Singularity because I believe that, um, uh, you know, we have the ability right now to so solve humanity's grand challenges, that we can fix all these problems for the billion of people out there. Mm -hmm. And that anyone can do it. I mean, the fact that you and I can both make impact humanity right now. Mm -hmm. It's a very unique opportunity in, in time and space when we can do this thing. This, this is what motivates me. It's all about giving back. Um, and, you know, you talk about me being a contrarian and taking positions. I don't give a damn. I mean, uh, so, I, <laughs> I, I, you know, I say something which is controversial, uh, make a mistake, I'll apologize for it. Yeah. But I express my opinion. People don't like it. They don't have to listen to me. Yeah, you know, that... I get harangued on Twitter by, these, uh, by some idiots. In fact, I had one guy calling me an idiot, idiot last night. My attitude is, you know, fuck you. Why don't you just uh, unfollow me? Why, why, why do I care? So, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, and as a as a as a blogger who hasn't been able to make money for the last two years, uh, I can uh, sympathize with with the motivation of wanting to make an, an impact and a difference. And and in terms of the input, I have somebody who, on a regular basis, sends me emails and tells me that I'm a traitor to humanity. Uh, because of my transhumanist views and so on. So I, I have anti-immigrant wackos setting up all these accounts on uh, Twitter to harass me. All I do is block them and, and they just talk to themselves. I mean, I don't, I don't give a damn. I mean, you know, I, I say what I believe. If yeah. you like it, listen to me. If you don't like it, go and listen to someone else. Yeah. Go and, you know, uh, stay in your, in, in your uh, you know, with these anti-immigrants. Let them, uh, uh, you know, be back, uh, stuck in the past if they want to. I'm, I'm doing what I think is right, and I'm doing it for the good of other people. It's all about giving back. I get nothing from this. I'm not yeah. making any money, even from my writing. I don't make any real money. I mean, get a token th uh, thing from the Washington Post, but that's it. And that's, I mean, hardly enough to buy dinner. Mm -hmm. So uh, it doesn't matter. It's not about um, taking it. It's all about giving. 
Yeah, but, but I think you are making an impact because uh, your voice is heard out there. And, and yes, it may be controversial, but there are people who are listening and there are people who appreciate it and respect it very much. And I'm one of them, actually, because then it I, makes do it follow you. I do right. follow you on Twitter and, and so right. on. Um, so let me ask you this then. You said you're not a singularitarian per se, but you're there for the impact. And you're very frank about, uh, you know, how you feel and all your views. And I really appreciate that. So let me ask you, and you, you've been very vocal about the bubble in tech stocks, for example, such as uh, Groupon and, and perhaps even Facebook. Uh, and I agree with you entirely on, especially on Groupon. I think that's... that's it's a scam. I mean, uh, yeah, I agree entirely. It's this investment bank. Is, is, is investment imaginary. bank is inflating value so that they can get rich and some uh, the, their clients can get rich. It's, it's all a, a scam. I mean, there's so many tech stocks right now that are ridiculously priced. And we know that they're going to drop. I mean, we know that they're going to come down to a tenth of the value within the next two or three years. Whether it's, you know, six months or, uh, or, or two or three years, it's inevitable. Yeah. So uh, uh, it's a losing proposition. That's not the way it should be. It, what it should be happening is that they should be priced moderately, deliver solid earnings, and then go up gradually so that people who invest in it can make, can make good money. So that it's the people that make money. And it's a management team that make money by making people successful. Right now, it's all about these greedy investment bankers making huge fees um, uh, you know, by taking companies public. And then these uh, venture capitalists and, and uh, CEOs reaping in big fortunes by ripping off the public. They don't seem to realize that you know, their, their millions are coming uh, from the pockets of innocent human beings, from grandma and grandpa who had stockbrokers call, stock calling them up, telling them how hot this Groupon thing is, how you're going to make uh, you know, double, triple your money within the next six months if you just buy it right now. And they're gullible. I mean, they don't know any better. They're not analysts. They can't cut through this crap when they have, you know, big name and, and you know, uh, investment banks calling them up. They know no differently. How, how can they know differently? And then what happens? All these people reap their fortune. Everyone is fat and happy in, um, in New York and in Silicon Valley. And then grandma in Iowa basically has lost her life savings. No one seems to worry about the impact they're going to make on it. The fact that the, the riches that these people made came from the backs of, uh, of innocent, you know, people, uh, innocent Americans who were just trying to you know, get a reasonable return on their savings. This is the life savings which people were talking about. Yeah. So there's no conscience over here and it, it makes me angry like you won't believe. Yeah, and perhaps I would come back to this topic, but, but I want to take a little bit of a different angle on it and say, what do you answer to people who say, okay, we agree with you, there's a bubble in tech stocks, but is there not a bubble in the singularity? Is that not like something which is way overblown, the exponentially growing technology, Ray Kurzweil becoming more and more popular, coming up on the Best Buy commercial, you know. So what, who is he harming? Who is he harming? I mean, what's, what's he doing? He's motivating people to think bigger and to, um, you know, to dream about what's possible. What happens is if, I mean, look at, this, you're talking about science fiction. In the 60s and the 70s, I used to watch Star Wars. I'm sure to watch, I used to watch uh, Star Trek. Mm -hmm. I was fanatical about Star Trek. I'd watch every episode the moment it was aired. And then I would watch every science fiction the movie there is. I dreamed and dreamed and dreamed about replicators and communicators and, and all of these you know, holographic devices and all these wonderful things that would, ha that would happen. And guess what? Nothing happened for 30 years. But I'm seeing, right now, my iPhone here is, uh, you know, ha has more technology than Captain Kirk's uh, communicator had in Star Trek. Captain Kirk's communicator you know, didn't surf the web. <laughs> it, it, it didn't, uh, uh, you know, run apps, okay? It didn't have, uh, you know, GPS maps on it. It didn't you know, do email, okay? So what I have over here is more than, than what I dreamed about when I was, uh, was a child. Yeah, it took 20 years longer than uh, I had dreamed, but so what? The fact is that an entire generation of technologists got the vision, got the bug, dreamed like this. It motivated them to think bigger and, 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 and work harder and to be smarter. It ended up doing good for the world. So let Ray Kurzweil you know, be a rock star and movie star and let people um, not believe him, but at least he's inspiring them. He's telling them about one possible you know, outcome, what one possible set of things which might happen if not 30 years from now, a thousand years from now. Mm -hmm. okay? So it doesn't matter, but the fact is you're, you're getting people to think, you're giving them you know, dreams and imagination, which is all good. He's not profiting from it. I don't see Ray Kurzweil you know, going around uh, ripping off grandma and grandpa. At, at worst, someone spends $30 in buying his book and amuses themselves for a few hours reading a book. What's the downside in that? Yeah, I, I agree entirely. And, and as, a, uh, as someone who fancies themselves a bit of a philosopher, 
uh, I would say that really the timeline is, is not so important. The major issues, whether they would arise in 20 or 30 or a couple of hundred years, are still going to be the same and we're still going to face those uh, problems that Ray is discussing. So why not consider them now and dream and debate and discuss and perhaps that would also give us the capability to direct them in the most favorable direction for us right. and, and, and have that impact that you were uh, talking about in the beginning. Let me ask you this then, um, is there any myths uh, with respect to the singularity in general or a singularity university in particular that you would like to dispel? For example, uh, one of the most common criticisms is uh, that it is uh, the rupture of the geeks, the church of robotics, uh, the rupture of the nerds kind of idea where, you know, None of the above. I tell you, if it was, I wouldn't be there. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm from uh, the business world, I'm from the academic world. It really, uh, even though the name is Singularity, even though Ray has been an inspiration and Ray, Ray, you know, is, uh, is, is doing, uh, is getting people to think and imagine and so on. We don't teach that stuff at Singularity. It's not about, it basically, we teach about practical developments that are happening in several technologies, how they're converging and the opportunities for entrepreneurs to solve humanity's grand challenges using these technologies. And in fact, uh, what I'm doing more, um, more than anything else right now at Singularity is bringing this whole focus of grand challenges into it. I want the theme, everything, which, when students come in there, I want them to start you know, discussing that here are the challenges of humanity, that we have energy problems here, we have poverty here, we have, um, uh, uh, I mean, lack of water here. I mean, all of these problems that are facing mankind, Americans don't understand this. So they need more education than people who come here from uh, you know, foreign countries, from the third world in particular. So I want to start off by teaching people what the problems are and then teaching them about these technologies and then get them to think about how do you solve them. So, so um, it's, it's all practical, you know, good stuff. Um, you know, um, I mean, if, I, don't, I don't think anyone uh, uh, who came to Singularity would, would walk out thinking that this is science fiction or this is impractical stuff or, or there's anything evil or sinister happening here. Not, none of the above. People walk out of Singularity, you know, completely um, blown away and, and they leave inspired to do good, to change, uh, to, to help mankind, to help other people. So, so like I said, talk, you know, these critics should talk to any graduate from our programs. I don't know if there are a couple of wacko graduates uh, that, I should, you know, that are the outliers or that, but so far everyone I've met has been a raving fan like you, basically. They really believe in it. And, and like me, the fact that I'm now devoting my time to this institution is because I know the good it can do to teach all of these exponential technologies, which should be called Exponential Technologies University or something like that, or Exponential Technologies College. I mean, that's really a better description than Singularity. Uh, th that might help some, somewhat in, in, in PR terms, uh, perhaps, yeah. Uh, but, uh, but let me ask you this then. Um, what's the next big, big, thi big thing then for Singularity University? Can you reveal anything that you have in the works? No, we're basically trying to, uh, uh, you know, uh, get to as many people as we can. Right now, I'm working on uh, on a major event, hopefully in Silicon Valley, which will bring together hundreds of world leaders and leaders and scientists and so on. So I'm, I'm working with Peter DeMattis and trying to take it to the next level so we can reach all these major decision makers and, and really, you know, get the word to the most senior levels of, uh, of decision making in the world so that they're aware of these technologies. It's not about SU, it's about teaching great people about the advances in technology that can help them solve the grand challenges. That's what SU is about. Fantastic, yeah. And I, and I can vouch entirely for, for what you're saying based on my 10-week experience there, which I would redo again any day uh, if I had the, the possibility to do it. And that's why I said I'm so jealous that you're there every day and I'm here in the other end of the continent right now. Um, but anyway, uh, that's life. One, one way for me to relive the experience is to keep uh, the conversation going, actually, uh, by meeting and talking to people such as you. And this way I'm helping not only myself personally uh, by staying sort of in touch and, and at, at the forefront of the ideas, but also uh, helping my audience educate themselves and, and stay similarly in touch with, with both the people and the ideas that they express. So. Um, would you like to, uh, I watched a, a video of you making a few predictions about uh, 2012, I think it was on Bloomberg perhaps, 
Right. Uh, would you dare to 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 make a few predictions uh, either in the shorter term or longer term in general terms of technology that you're seeing on the horizon that are going to change the world and have that impact that we're seeking? Well, my prediction is by the end of this decade, we're now going to have uh, uh, 3D printers becoming pervasive that will be doing, uh, you know, um, mid-range manufacturing, not large-scale manufacturing, that'll be different, but we'll be doing a lot of uh, manufacturing in our homes. Mm -hmm. So just like we have laser printers at home, we'll have 3D printers for doing a lot of the stuff that we have. That'll be towards the later part of this decade. And early part of the decade, we'll be getting more and more, uh, early part of the next decade, we're getting more and more sophisticated. By the end of this decade, we'll also have the tricorders in common use, so that uh, just like we have these iPhone, you know, you basically touch the, uh, touch the iPhone, uh, and it'll scan your, your body and tell you, you know, uh, what, what disease you have and, um, and it'll keep track of what you, because you keep it in your pocket, it keeps track of what you've done, what you've eaten. And you basically have tricorder like devices which are about the size of this, which diagnose health and, uh, you know, which help you. Also, robotics and, and AI will um, converge even faster. It's only now that, you know, real robotics is becoming possible because computing power has become small enough so that, um, so that you can have uh, uh, very sophisticated processors that, that do voice recognition, face recognition, that can now uh, uh, you know, operate sophisticated uh, uh, motors and so on um, within you know, small devices so that robots will become a lot more practical, a lot more um, uh, uh, you know, pervasive. They'll be doing household, household chores probably by the end of this decade, early in the, in the next decade. I mean, it's almost certainly going to be, you know, robots are certainly going to be used more and more for manufacturing. That's a no-brainer. But I, I see them happening. We will have the Roombas, you know, uh, next generation uh, Roombas in the home as well. As well. Mm -hmm. Voice recognition within the next five years will come to the point that you're able to talk to Siri and she really understands you. Yeah. So that, uh, uh, you know, Google's business model will be in serious trouble because we won't need to do text links anymore. We'll just be talking. I mean, uh, we'll, uh, we'll be talking to our uh, uh, phones or our communicators just like, um, uh, you know, we, I'm talking to you and, and it'll transcribe and understand Mm -hmm. Pretty well. I mean, we're almost there right now. Dragon Dictate is you know, is really an excellent product. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll be able to do much more sophisticated uh, voice recognition within the next five years or so. Okay. So, like I said, the, uh, the, and and then um, uh, medicine. We, we by the end of the decade, we probably will be synthesizing uh, personalized medicines. Uh, so, you know, it's synthetic. Um, 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 so, I mean, um, when it comes to now, uh, you know, under, harnessing the genome, the fact that. The genome has been um, been uh, digitized, and the fact that it, uh, the costs are dropping dramatically within five years, it will be down to hundred dollars or so, mm -hmm. and we'll be will be mapping each other's genomes, comparing it, comparing what diseases we have, and then hopefully coming up with better remedies for people, all within this decade. So these are you know amazing things which are happening in the short term. The, for this year, I talked about the fact that tablet computers will become pervasive. I have no doubt that that will happen by the end of the year. We will have sub hundred dollar tablet devices which now are available uh, you know in many countries of the world yeah. by next year you'll have uh, you know uh, uh, tens of millions of these the year after you'll have hundreds of millions of these tablet devices becoming available all over the world mm -hmm. suddenly the masses will have access to the same knowledge that we do mm -hmm. that you'll have you know poor people in india china brazil all over the world now having access to these tablet -like devices to the same knowledge that we have over here so it's going to be an amazing decade you know, I'm very optimistic about all the good things that are going to happen. Fantastic. And what about the risks, though? Is there something that What's really it? scares even you or worries risks. you? Yeah, even more risks. You're going to have hackers hacking, um, you know, DNA, genomes. You'll have already the cloud is a, is a major uh, issue. I, I talked about cloud burst, yeah. that you're going to have major theft. The, you know, right now you have governments that are partying on all the information that they get. It's a, um, they're stealing all, it's just all you can steal by fair. <laughs> for uh, for uh, you know evil governments and you know and I know what the, who those governments are, yeah. so there are a lot of downsides. There are a lot of risks. Privacy is goes out the door because uh, uh, this. I mean, Google itself is now consolidating all this information about us. Google knows what. I mean, Google knows what my friends are saying to me even before I do. Google reads my emails before I do, right? So it knows what I'm thinking, what I'm what I'm up to. It knows where I am. So it's scary how much information Google has. Google. Um, the data that Google has would make Big Brother envious. Mm -hmm. So a lot happening. I mean, good and bad. But uh, I look at the good and I look at the you know the optimistic side of it. So you're still optimistic overall. I'm optimistic, absolutely. 
Okay, so I know you're very busy and uh, I will try to bring our interview here within the next five or six minutes. I have about three questions left. Um, yeah. The first one is, um, what about to those people who say uh, something like this? Look, the biggest problems that our civilization are, is facing today are either social or political or environmental, which is to say, again, more po political and, and social. And the solution you're proposing are technological. And therefore, by definition, you wouldn't be able to have a technological solution proper to a social or a political issue. See, a lot of the, a lot of the, uh, uh, the battles that are being fought between countries and gets down to natural resources. For example, energy right now, you know, the way China is having to go and buy everything up, it's competing with, um, with the United States and, and all of these things and so on. If energy becomes abundant, then that battle goes away. Okay? It's predicted that there'll be battles over water. If water becomes abundant, those, those battles go away as well. <clears throat> now, this issue about social, that's what worries me the most. I mean, it's very likely that we create uh, abundance and prosperity. The question is, will we distribute that? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Okay, I, I, I mean, uh, I don't know if humanity will progress fast enough in the next decade or two to keep up with the advances that are happening in technology. And if anything, that's where the risk factors lie for this world. That if we don't learn to share and to you know, help others, we're going to be, um, we'll, ha we'll have civil wars all, all over the place. We'll have lots of uh, instability and so on. So I'm hoping that, uh, that you know, we do rise above it. That these corrupt politicians, I mean, uh, that they just get enough that they can stop stealing from, from the rest of the from rest of us and now start focusing on doing their jobs and, and helping uh, you know, the, uh, the people that they're supposed to be serving. So uh, again, the social thing, no one can control, but all we can do is work towards solving problems and creating abundance. Mm -hmm. So in that sense uh, of abundance, you're a little less optimistic than Peter Diamandis, I take it. No, I mean, I'm optimistic in different ways. Um, uh, I'm, a, I'm a optimistic also. Mm -hmm. I think we will get there. I think he's right. I see. Okay. Uh, so the, the second last question that I always ask of my guest is very simple. Where can people go and find more information about you and your work? My website, wadwa.com, W-A-D-H-W-A dot com. You, you can keep up with me there or on Twitter, um, at Wadwa. I mean, I'm always on Twitter. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, and I know some of your tweets get very popular, so I recommend people uh, follow you there. Right. And uh, the very last question is this. Do you have a single message, perhaps the most important thing that you would like our viewers and listeners to take away from this interview with you today? Yeah, the message is that they can change the world. You know, you're not, not, depend, not dependent on governments, on big business or anyone else. You can take on anyone. You can solve any of the problems of humanity in your domains. In other words, take what you know, take your knowledge and apply it to, to doing good for the world, that you can solve the problems of the world, that, that it's now possible for human beings, regular human beings, to do what only governments could do before. I'm echoing what Peter Diamandis keeps talking about, that we can make it happen. I really sincerely believe that. That's a fantastic point to end our conversation on, Vivek. Thank you very all much. My friend, all, all the best. Yeah.